You know, this is the Knicks, and this is welcome to the roller coaster of expectations, right? And having all eyes on you at all the time, at all times. And you know, most listen, teams get blown out. You know, stars have bad nights. All stars have bad nights, and they can shake it off. But when you have these sort of new expectations, you know, the stinkers are really going to be a lot more noticeable. And that one was particularly ugly last night from the Knicks, and specifically from Julius Randle. And you know, you just hope, and they should have a nice little cushion here to go on and play the Oklahoma City Thunder next on Saturday afternoon game. Now, granted, they've lost to the Thunder once this year, but that should be a game that they can rebound and and try to win, you know, and, and they are going to have to win the games they should win. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's at the point where the Knicks are right now. They need to win the games they should win. But last night, I mean, when you have Randall who was just particularly, do you want to call it rusty? Do you want to call it tired? I mean, three for 12, five turnovers, and I thought the the biggest indignity was when Giannis just strips the ball from him and goes the other way for a flush dunk, and it's like, oh, man, just not your night. And, you know, I, I, the only reason I worry, and again, all stars have bad nights. I get it. But the only reason why you worry is because Randall is the engine. And yeah, but can we? Can we? Uh, no, I, I get that. But I'm not we, overreacting to it. Moose. No, no. I, can I'm we just, just look at it is Milwaukee. I mean, that right, it was I a mean, bad game for him. It sure. And the, and it, the it was in general. Right. It, and, but I, I don't know if I necessarily need to go where you know he's tired or um, this is. Uh, how would you describe uh, how he looked last night? I I think he had a bad game. I mean, honestly, I, and, and guys are going to have a bad game. He's not Giannis. I mean, he's he, you know, that he's not that caliber of player. And even Giannis has had bad games. But I mean, I, I look at I look at Julius Randle last night. I thought the Knicks overall had a, played a terrible basketball they game, did. as Thibodeau said afterward. They didn't guard the perimeter. Uh, did a terrible job on the glass. Uh, their big star that they need to to play particularly well in and and play great is Julius Randle. I just don't want to overreact to one game because. I was kind of expecting it. I, I wasn't expecting a miracle last night. Like I, I think I have a good. I think we all have a good feel about what this Nick team is and and what they're not. And you know they're not Milwaukee. They're not Philadelphia. They're not Brooklyn. They're not the Clippers. They're not the Nuggets. They're not the Lakers. They're not the Utah Jazz. They're they're not that kind of team right now. That's why we've talked a, a lot about what you know the the brain trust led by Leon Rose can do in the next thirteen days. Uh, before the NBA trade deadline uh, comes and goes. I mean, that is where you need to improve this team, Maggie. Now, could it have looked a little tighter? Yeah. I mean, listen, they got their doors blown off. I guess it it could have looked a little bit better, but was I going into that game last night expecting the Knicks uh, to to win in Milwaukee? No, because I think the Bucs are on a different level. Now, Randall played terribly. You know, he did. He had a bad basketball game, but I also have seen Julius Randle enough this year to know that I think he can bounce back. And you're right, that was an embarrassing moment of the game. And, you know, the the Milwaukee Bucks turning turnovers into dunks the other way. And and they were draining threes. The ball movement was fantastic. And the Knicks defense was, was absolutely lost at times. I'd just be a little bit leery, and I wouldn't do it, is I wouldn't all of a sudden start grading out Randall or look at Randall last night and say and, and make a bold declaration about if he's tired or exhausted. I, I think Julius Randall had a bad game. I think okay, the Knicks went up against a I'm, I'm significantly making, better I'm team. I'm not making any grand declarations. I'm not making any grand declarations, but it didn't look good. And the fact is I'm not actually just looking at this game also – I'm looking at even right before the trade deadline. So you had the two games, or not the trade deadline, pardon me, the All-Star break. You're you're talking about those two games before the All-Star break. And remember that San Antonio game where we looked and said, man, like who looked like the team that was playing off the back-to-back that night? It looked like the Knicks were the ones, even though it was the San Antonio Spurs who had gone to overtime with the Nets the night before. And it was the Knicks were the ones, and specifically Randall. And I thought, man, maybe Thibodeau will actually give him a little bit of a break in that final game before the All-Star break against the Detroit Pistons. And instead, he logged 42 minutes in that game against the Detroit Pistons right before before the break. And, and And they did win, and that's great. And now coming out, it's like, this is what we talked about, about making sure that the Knicks are playing their best basketball at the end of the season. It's just one game. I understand it. But it's going to be a, a it's got to be a priority to make sure that Julius Randle is getting what he needs. And maybe 
Maybe it was a little bit more rest. Maybe it's not. We're going to find out. But one thing I will say about a- another thing you kind of notice with the Knicks, you know, and again, you're not making huge declarations off of a couple games, but it is obviously clear what Derrick Rose means to this team. And Derrick Rose was, you know, kind of like a, a basically an afterthought. But he has this great relationship with Thibodeau. He comes here in a supporting cast role. But you can see, and it's easy to see, how much the Knicks value his skill set. And so with Rose out again for another game, I mean, it really does take a hit to their to their backcourt. You know, Rose is somebody who has been very good for this team. I believe they're 7-3 and three when he plays. And so with that in mind, like, you have to believe that was Thibodeau pushing right for Rose because they have this great relationship. And it might not have been a hard sell. I mean, maybe Leon Rose and World Wide West and, and Brock Aller were, like, all into it. But you have to believe that probably came from the Thibodeau side. And seeing now what kind of value Derrick Rose has to this team, I wonder if that gives Thibodeau an even louder voice in that room before the trade deadline. I'm not saying he doesn't already have a loud voice, but even louder because if he was banging the table for Rose and you see now how important that trade is and and should be and how important he is to the Knicks, does Thibodeau get another one, quote unquote, like so to speak, before yeah, the maybe. deadline? Yeah, maybe. I mean, listen, and, and Rose is when he's been here and you do understand the importance of Derrick Rose and he is completely bought in. He wanted to be back with Tom Thibodeau. He had a good rapport relationship with Thibodeau when they were coach and player in Chicago with the Bulls and that relationship does continue here. So, yeah, maybe it, it does give Thibodeau a little bit more sway, but... I think it's also got be has to be within reason too. I mean, I I think in and Thibodeau, you know, said it the other day. He, you know, who doesn't like talented players? And the Knicks are going to need to upgrade this roster. We've been, we, you know, we've talked about that, and and Tom Thibodeau understands that. I think the Knicks as a brass as an organization understand that, but it, it might not be the. You know, it might be more of the Andre Drummond than it is obviously the big splash move yeah, in the next couple of weeks. I don't, I don't, I don't think know that's if it happening. needs to be well, that big splash. Well, I don't Tom know if Thibodeau, that's even possible right now. But, but here's the deal: it, you know, Thibodeau's always going to have a say. I mean, is the Derrick Rose acquisition how it's worked? Gonna where they gave up a player that had really no role in the organization had given up on him and Dennis Smith Jr. Um, does that give Thibodeau now more sway within the organization or a little bit more power? I don't know. I mean, it, it might. It might. I think they're always going to look at the coaching staff to see, and that's what a good team does. What kind of players does our coach need to to orchestrate the system that he's trying to emphasize on the court that's going to bring about winning days? It's got to be that kind of correlation. Uh, if it's not, you're going to have two, t- two sides that are working in opposite directions. So it could. Here's the problem the Knicks have. You know, we, we talk about, you know, minutes with Tom Thibodeau and people, you know, run past his history and the amount of minutes that players log. And there are some guys that feed off of it. And Julius Randle certainly did in the first half. The Knicks have no choice. I mean, they, they really don't. I mean, there is not, you look at this team, it's not a case of Tom Thibodeau is playing Julius Randle and, and R.J. Barrett the amount of minutes because, He's playing and and he's got better options or he's got just as good of options. He doesn't. So that's the issue that the Knicks are in. As good of a story as they have been, and they're a 500 basketball team after the loss last night in Milwaukee, Maggie, but I'd make the argument where, you know, the Knicks really don't have a choice. Randall's got to log those minutes. They're not a deep team. If, If they don't, if he doesn't, um, you know, we joked around about him still being on the court in, you know, in games that were long decided in the fourth quarter because there is that trust factor that Tom Thibodeau has in the player and doesn't feel the security to be able to take him off the court. So you're going to get more of that here moving forward. I would not expect Julius Randle to all of a sudden getting getting rest late in games if it's decided one way or the other. I mean, if it's ridiculous, then yes. I mean, if it's a 20-point or 30-point game, maybe. But he's going to continue to log the same amount of minutes that he logged in the first half because the Knicks have got nowhere else to turn. We've talked about the importance of Julius Randle. So he's got to continue to play well. And, you know, he had a bad game last night. The Knicks overall played a garbage basketball game last night in Milwaukee. And they got run off the court against one of the top three teams in the Eastern Conference. Yeah, I mean, but that's that's a kind of like to my point, right? 
Julius Randle is so important to what they're doing that even you saw RJ last night. RJ had a good shooting night last night. What do you have, 22 points last night? It just, yep. he can't carry the team yet. And Milwaukee is such a good team that maybe that would have never, that, that's not a one man effort, right? That's going to be able to beat the Milwaukee Bucks. But that's even like to my point. That's why it's going to be, I think, incumbent on Thibodeau to steal minutes when you can, you know, to steal moments when you can to try and give Julius Randle some kind of rest. And listen, Randle's not asking for it, right? He makes everyone very aware that he is leading the league in minutes played and hasn't missed a game yet, no doubt about that. And I understand why he wants to let everyone know that, because I would, I would too. But that's why it's going to be like we're, we're talking about the evolution of Tibbs and like, I get that he doesn't have a lot of choices here. He doesn't have a lot of good choices. But at the same time, it's got to be about making sure you keep your best player operating at peak performance. And that might that might have to be – you might have to, well, he only played 20 because he couldn't hit a shot, and he was turning the no, ball I over. Get it. He was hurting the I, team. I understand, but last night was a game in which it was, ended up being a 33-point loss. He yep. only logged 29 minutes. and, and listen, so last That was night, the they, fewest they, of the season. They shot 35% from the floor, and the Bucks nearly hit 50% of their threes. I mean, game set match over in 2021 NBA. I mean, that's if the Knicks can't, they're not going to be able to go toe to toe with with an offensive team. Um, uh, you know, they're they're just not unless that team in, in Milwaukee does play a lick of defense. So they're just not good enough and efficient enough offensively, even if they were shooting the ball well before the All Star break. So you look at that game last night, Maggie. I went into it, watched it, was not surprised that that game got out of hand. Maybe was a little bit surprised at how poorly Julius Randle played, but they were a decided underdog going in for a reason, and then you got a little bit of a, a feel about where this Nick team is, and you got humbled a little bit. And I, I, I never, I'm not putting expectations that this team has to be this or has to be that. I, they're a playoff contender in the Eastern Conference. Uh, if I, I think when you look at this schedule, if they play the way that they did in the first half, I think they could be a playoff team in the East. But they've got to go out there and do it. And Randall needs better nights than the one that he had last night. And as a team, they've got to they have to have an understanding that is an out that is a game that you highlight and say if we play like this, we're going to get our doors blown off by Brooklyn, by Philadelphia, by Milwaukee. All these teams yep. are just going to blow our doors off because that's just the stone cold reality. The defense wasn't good enough. And you're also not under the radar anymore. And neither is Randall. And that's my point, is that the stinkers are going to be a lot more magnified because you're an all-star now. I'm not saying that you are garbage. I'm not saying that we're judging you off of that. They're just going to be noticeable. And the thing is, is that it's up to Thibodeau and the coaching staff to make sure that they are in some ways protecting Julius Randall because he is so important to this team. And I thought it was a little bit ironic that the Knicks lose last night by 33 points because, of course, that's the number hanging in the rafters for the one and only Patrick Ewing. And it was interesting because last night after yesterday, after the Georgetown game and after they beat Villanova, right, you have yeah. Patrick Ewing giving his post-game Zoom call or what have you. Or actually, reporters are actually at the Garden, so it's post-game uh, press. And I think this was without even being asked, Moose. I think this was totally unprompted. He took issue with the security guards at Madison Square Garden, in his words, accosting him. I mean, stopping him, it sounds like, often, not just one or two people, but often to check his security tag. And he was, like, I think genuinely miffed, right? Yeah, do like, we, I mean, Connor, do we have the audio? I think yeah, that he see. was genuinely frustrated by this, although some people thought he was just joking around. You listen, you be the joke. Let's hear Patrick. Um, but I do want to say one thing, though. They, I, I thought this was my building, and I feel terrible that I'm getting stopped, accosted, asking for passes. I, I, everybody in this building should know who the hell I am. And I'm getting stopped. I can't move around this building. Like I, I, I was like, what the hell? Is this Madison Square Garden? I'm going to have to call Mr. Dolan and say, geez, is my number in the rafters or what? <laughs> Apparently he did have a conversation with Dolan last night. Um, and there was like a, a – there was kind of like a, they got to the bottom of it, I guess. And here's the thing. Like, <laughs> to me, 
to me, someone who covers sports for a living, who grew up in the Ewing era, this is mind-blowing, right? How could anybody not see who Patrick Ewing is? How could they not understand what he means to that building, to the city, to the franchise? Like, Patrick Ewing, of all people, how could he get stopped at that? It is his house, you know? I get it, and I get why he would be frustrated by it. I also understand that there's a reality that the security guards who are stopping him most likely are not doing it because they are, you know, just so worried that Patrick Ewing looks like some kind of threat. No, they're probably doing it because a boss or a superior probably, I would say, put the fear of God into them. Like, you must be checking everyone's security badge. It doesn't matter if, like, the president walks in. We need you there's to check There's a lot of people security. that don't. There's a lot of people that don't watch sports. I think I mean, both just, can be true. It's days. not the security yeah. guard's fault, necessarily. It's not their fault that, that they are doing their job. And I can also see from Ewing's point of view where he could be like, you got to be kidding me. My, literally, my jersey and my name is hanging from the rafters. Like, is it reasonable for people to know who I am? I get that. I I, I think Patrick has a, had, totally has a point here. Yeah, I don't I don't think there's I don't think there's any doubt. I, I don't think anyone. Uh, I think what Patrick had to say, voicing his displeasure at Madison Square Garden, but there there are people that don't know who Patrick Ewing is. Uh, there are people that don't watch sports. There are people that that amazingly enough don't know who Michael Jordan is um, and and everything. That don't pay attention. I mean, that that's it. I mean, just like, you know, if you know a great artist walked across me that I would have no idea who he or she might be. And some people would be like, oh, my God, would be a guest. Uh, I'd have no idea. Not that they're not great at what they do. I just don't pay attention to what they do. So it's not kind of in my – it's not in my foray. So I, I – I, I, right, it's not Boos, surprising it's not, it's if, you're, like they, if you're Patrick Ewing and you're the head coach of the Georgetown Hoyas and you're a security guard working at Madison Square Garden, you know, you've been told that basically no excuses, that everybody's got to have a pass. Um, I don't care who he or she might be. I uh, can't walk around. And, you know, those that individual or individuals that accosted uh, Patrick Ewing probably had no idea who the hell Patrick Ewing was. It doesn't take away from what he meant at Madison Square Garden. It's just individuals doing their job because they were told before then, you know, not to do it. So, I, I mean, I you look at it, you would think that everybody working at Madison Square Garden would be a sports fan, would have an idea who Patrick Ewing is. And it's not like Patrick Ewing is, you know, 5'10". You know, he's seven feet. <laughs> He stands he, you out. Know, he's a he's a guy that's crossed over. You know, it's it's not like he's a member of the dream team, Hoya Paranoia. It's not like he was just a good Nick. He was an all time great Nick and an all time great NBA player. That is what's so startling about this. So that's what hits everybody so much. And it's not like it's down in Greensboro, North Carolina. It's at Madison Square Garden where Patrick Ewing, as he's coaching Georgetown, can look up and see the banner honoring him and his career here in New York as a Nick. So, like, I I understand your point of, like, not everyone's a sports fan, and I wouldn't expect a security guard to know every member of Billy Joel's band or who whatever, you know, bands are coming to to the garden and performing all the time either. But would you expect him to know Billy Joel? I would expect them to know Billy Joel because here's the thing, right? You mentioned, like, I wouldn't know a famous artist if they walked in, right? Yeah, I they have no idea. But you also are not working at an art gallery in Chelsea. You know, like if you were working at an art gallery in Chelsea, maybe there might be an expectation that you would know who the most famous artists are and that that might not be unreasonable. It's not like people were stopping, you know, just random people on the street outside of the garden with a picture of Patrick Ewing saying, do you know who this man is? Like you are working in the building and I can see where Patrick yeah, would say, it, is it reasonable are... to know who I am? Because no, I, I there's understand a, that. I don't he's a Patrick. VIP, you know? No, I get it, but I, I don't fault Patrick for being frustrated by that. But I think both things can be true. I, I think I think Patrick can be just as frustrated, have that conversation with James Dolan last night, and the audio is fantastic and kind of... You know, having that wry smile at the end of it as you could as you could hear it as he's describing it. You know, but I, I also think that people are there just doing their job. I, I don't I don't think everyone's going through every single coach that's gonna be there and player that's gonna be there and former player that's gonna be there. You know, and it's not even a packed house. They're just basically been told, Hey, 
Look for the security badges. Right. Okay, Look but for the about, IDs. Make right, sure that it. everyone's wearing the ID. Make sure there's no excuses. Nobody can just be walking around aimlessly doing whatever they want to do. You know, this is what we have to do now. This is what we're doing. And you know, that person probably just didn't look at and went up to Patrick Ewing and said, where's your ID? What is going on? And Patrick's like, well, what do you mean? I'm, I'm Patrick Ewing. Well, okay. So in defense of Ewing on that front, if it was just someone who was doing their job, do you think he actually would have brought this up at a post-game press conference? Like, I think that even if, say, it's like one guy, it's like, oh, Bill, we know Bill never watched basketball, but he works at the Garden. Ha, 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 Bill, you don't even know who Patrick Ewing is. I have no idea. Like, I don't think Patrick Ewing would bring this up if it was just, like, one person doing their job. And I think he would – he's got to be reasonable. Like, he would understand. He was saying this was, like, he made it sound like this was over-the-top, consistent, like – he said accosted. I mean, I don't think this was one time someone being like, sir, can you please have your badge? Well, and all of a sudden, he wasn't he's bringing wearing this his to the ID. World. I have no idea. But, I mean, maybe it did happen. I mean, okay, so it did happen on Like, a I want to give Ewing a little benefit of the doubt there where he well, wouldn't bring it up if it was just one person. Not, and he's no, like, you're just I, doing I just, your job, Mary. I just think you know? it's – I think it's it, – it, for what we do, I think it surprises – a lot of people that, you know, and what we do, we love sports. We live it, eat it, breathe it 24-7. There are people that walk around that could care less about what happens with the Yankees, the Mets, you know, that they, what happens in basketball, what, what Julius Randle's going to do in the second half. Could have no idea whether Patrick Ewing played at Duke, Georgetown, or Creighton. I mean, so, yeah. I mean, there are people out there that could care less about what happens, you know, during March Madness. I mean, that's just the truth. Men and women. I mean, so, I mean, so I, I don't know. And if it happened on two or three occasions, I'm not trying to be critical of Patrick. I, it, it's not. I'd be frustrated, too, if I were him. He's an all-time great player. And it's his house. It's his building. He dominated here. Unfortunately, he didn't want an NBA title, but he dominated. I love Patrick Ewing. I really do. And I root for him and have all the success he can with the Georgetown Hoyas. But, you know, people were almost aghast by it. Well, I'm, there is another, there are other people that are just taking jobs just to have a job. And they're, they're a security guard at Madison Square Garden could care less who wins the Big East tournament could care less what players are walking by them or what head coach is walking by them. They don't know them from any Tom, Dick, and Harry out there. So, I mean, that's just the reality. Now, if that surprises you, well, then that surprises you. But that's that's the truth. So if it happened on two or three occasions with Patrick Ewing at Madison Square Garden to where then he's vocally frustrated, I get that from Patrick. I understand that. He can be frustrated. Both things can be true. And you could just have people that are just doing their jobs and really have no idea who the hell Patrick Ewing is. Is that surprising to some? Absolutely. Well, but here's the thing. It's like, it's not like, again, it's not like they went down to pastis at brunch and start holding up photos saying, do you know who this man is? And it's Patrick Ewing. Like, maybe there actually needs to be, like, if you are not somebody who is familiar <laughs> with basketball and you're working the Big East tournament, maybe you're taking tickets and not working at the coach's entrance. Working why why, on why the not wear the ID? How about you wear the ID? <laughs> do we know that he wasn't? Uh, well, how would he not be? Well, you Why said would they were checking shocked? the ID. Yeah, they were checking Just the ID. Just making sure. I, right. I, we don't know the details here, but enough where he felt like this was a, enough to bring to the national media. He <laughs> well, knew he that frustrated. this was going to get attention. I mean, he was frustrated because Patrick, of course, and it's ego. Let's not also forget about it, too. I mean, this yeah, is, this have, is ego from Patrick Ewing. This is him person. walking into his building. It's Madison Square Garden. He is, it is New York City. We all know about the frozen envelope, uh, you know, th- deal with Stern and in, in the, in the mid-80s draft coming out of Georgetown. I mean, Patrick Ewing is a historic, not just college player, is a historic NBA player. And I'm sure it has to do well with a lot of ego because he's walking into it and saying, how the hell do you not know who I am? Do you understand what I was as a player, what I've done here in the Big East, what I've done here at Madison Square Garden as a member of the Knicks? And and I get that. I can understand that. So yeah, but Moose, I think if ego, ego comes so, into play as well. If your ego is that big that you would need like that, that, that uh, a security guard not knowing who you are would be enough to damage that ego or to bruise that ego at all. Why well, would sure you it bring it to the pu- occasion? Why would we bring that to the public? It only why? makes you look worse because it's like it's like it, you're acknowledging people in your own building don't know who you are. That doesn't help your cause. 
Well, I, I no, I get it. I I, it's I understand that point. It, is it really? I don't know if Patrick. Well, Ewing's I think embarrassed. no. I think I, I don't know if he's embarrassed, but I, I think, think that it is a bruised ego. It's I think a bruised Patrick ego. Ewing walks so I wouldn't into, bring that to the world. I think Ewing walks into Manhattan and f- expects everyone to know who he is, and rightfully I think, so. No, not Manhattan. He should have, the garden. He should the garden. He should not have, Manhattan. I think you know. Listen, I, I think you're walking around Midtown Manhattan during normal times, and yeah, he's, he you're working and walk walking into feet. Times Square. I mean, Patrick Ewing. Yeah, a lot of people are gonna. And I think he has the ego, and that's fine. He should. He should. I'm not saying he shouldn't. He should. He was that great of a player. His his defense. Yeah, you know, what he did at Georgetown. What he did with the Knicks. That ego should be there. I would be bothered as well if I were Patrick Ewing. I would bring it to the public forefront as well. I'm not looking at it as an embarrassment. I'm looking at it as basically WTF. Like what is going on here? How the hell do you not know who I am? Do you know what I did in this city? Do you know what I did in this building? Do you know what I did for the university that I now coach? Uh, so I get it. I understand it, Patrick. I didn't. I don't look at Patrick any differently. I thought it was kind of. Oh, I don't. I, I, I think it's it's eye opening to the fact that there are people that just look at Patrick Ewing and see there is a tall man and don't understand what he is.